All right, so tonight we're going to be talking about parsing expression grammars. And we're going to be making our own programming language using PEG.js. Um, so yeah, uh, up to this point, um, you know, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript have collectively functioned as you know the lingua franca of the web. It's like if you want to build something that's connecting people, you're probably using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript um, backed by some backend language, maybe even JavaScript. Um, some of the largest apps in the world, um, you know, are built using these three languages. Um, in addition to some backend language like you know Facebook, PayPal, YouTube, but we're talking about apps that have completely revolutionized industries um, and experiences. Um, so we should be really proud, right? Um, yeah, sort of. It, it turns out that um, in the beginning, while these languages were being designed, they were designed with um, usability and productivity shortcomings none of their creators anticipated, and that largely has to do with, you know, us as developers taking these programming languages outside of the boundaries of what they were designed to do. Um, you know, these languages were primarily designed to build content-based sites with, with like bits of inter interactivity um, versus like, you know, the interaction-heavy websites that we use now like Facebook, Twitter, um, Vine. Um, so yeah, an example of an older site that was perfect for this was uh, the Space Jam site. And here we have uh, Junior Jam um, portion of the website and we have our one bit of animation. <laughs> in the corner that actually isn't script driven, it's just a GIF. And uh, you can see it's like, it's just pretty, pretty happy there, right? Um, so unfortunately, the approachability and egalitarianism of um, envisioned by Tim Berners-Lee and his peers um, isn't really suitable for uh, building large scale applications. Um, and what I mean by that is like, you know, for example, um, not being able, something as simple as being able to nest uh, things within CSS uh, can become a pain when you're, you know, trying to get one work done quickly. Um, and, but we managed to build these pretty complicated apps um, with these tools for quite some time. And uh, eventually, you know, people got fed up, I guess, developers. Um, so then came the source to source compilers, you know, like your CoffeeScript, your Lest, your SAS, um, and, you know, a number of others. Um, and these languages make things like substantially easier. Um, far more palatable for seasoned engineers and newcomers um, by handling like you know language blemishes like you know odd behaviors in JavaScript or like gotchas like I mentioned earlier not being able to nest things um, in CSS. So in the next slide I have um, some code that demonstrates that. Uh, plenty of you in the audience have probably already seen this, but for example, less um, here's some of that nesting I was talking about earlier. Um, you don't have really have to repeat yourself to say, I'd like the link with the promotion class to be the color orange, and I'd also like it to you know, do this thing when someone hovers over it, and it generates that um, somewhat elegant code for you. Um, similarly, uh, the same applies for another one of these languages, CoffeeScript. You know, we're all familiar with this. We've you know, beaten this stuff into the ground, right? Um, and newer versions of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript are getting like jewelry features um, that you know stand on their own, and they're also incorporating some of the great things that um, were thought of in these uh, scripting languages. But um, you know, we're not here to discuss the viability of you know said languages going forward. Uh, we're here to write our own, and the way we're going to do that is using PEG.js. Um, and PEG.js, of course, is a parser generator. So what's a parser generator? A parser generator is a program capable of reading in a specification and generating another program to reprogram code that adheres to the rules in the specification. <laughs> right? Just like totally like, whoa, Morpheus. Um, so we're going to be looking at a parser generator you know, library as I mentioned before, called PEG.js. And there are a number of others, um, in particular one called Jison, which is, um, uses a different syntax, but today we're primarily gonna be focusing on um, PEG.js. And we're gonna start by looking at a language I built called ClassyScript. Um, and it's not very complicated. In fact, it's sort of a contrived example of showing you how you'd go about building your own 
a language. And it's a learning tool to demonstrate how traditional classes translate to JavaScript. And when I say traditional, tr traditional classes, I mean like you know C++ style um, classes with access specifiers, um, like you know public and private and virtual and things like that. Um, so we have our expected input. Um, if you've ever programmed C++, you'll notice that this doesn't exactly adhere. There's no like you know typing going on here. But we have the class dog, and it has two access specifier sections, um, one public and one private. Um, and in this next example, I know this is probably going to elicit some odd feelings amongst people, but um, it's just a very contrived example. We're going to see the expected output for JavaScript. Um, and that's going to be this object. Um, so the this.numt would represent you know, our public member, and then var happiness would be our private one. Um, so yeah, let's get this going here. We're going to go to the PEG.js site. They have a live man, if I hadn't had that kernel panic. Okay. So this is the site. It has very excellent documentation. Um, well, well, whoops. Okay. Well, it just disappeared. Oh, wow. This is, this is fun. All right, are we cooperating now? Awesome. Um, so it's a bit, it's a tad large. Um, but when you go to the online version tab, there, the, the live editor is already populated with a generator, um, a parser generator and a grammar. So this particular grammar is a classic calculator, uh, much like you'd see in Spotlight. Um, so it does like, you know, math. And we're just gonna run through how this grammar is defined very quickly. So um, we start with an expression that is an additive. And an additive is defined as a left multiplicative and a right additive. A multiplicative is defined as a left primary um, flanked by a right multiplicative with this um, the asterisk uh, standing in this, you know, the multiplication operator um, or primary. And a primary is just an integer um, that can, and an integer is, you know, the digits zero through nine, and there must at least be, be you know, one pre present. Um, I don't know, this grammar isn't the best to start with, so I'm just gonna like get this out of here, and I think it'll be a little bit clearer what's going on when we um, start building classy script. Um, so, just give me one second. <laughs> I'm just going to take this out of here. And we're going to drop that in here. OK, so um, we are already getting an error because this output is not supported by our parser. Um, and as you can see, I have the wrong comment up here. Um, so cool. So. This one is a bit clearer, I think, because it's less abstract than the mathematical example, but we're going to start with a class definition. And the class definition is defined as starting with, beginning with the word class separated by white space, um, following an identifier, which if you look just before this comment here, are the letters, you know, either lowercase a through z or uppercase a through z in as great a quantity as you'd like. Um, which is sort of a bug in this, and I'll show you that just now. Um, so following that, we have white space, then an opening curly brace, then a bit more white space. Um, wow, this is actually not the version I was hoping to show. Yeah, this is like not even, wow. OK. 
Okay. So that should yield us um, an output. Oh, wow. This is a. Uh... I'm sorry, just give me one second. Yeah. So the class has to be bookended by. Uh... Oh, I, I don't know. There's a bug on this page that resizes this entry box. But you saw we were able to turn this into a JavaScript function, which is a, which is a first class object. Um, I think. Uh, my example got screwed up, um, so I will not be able to show you the remainder of this language, but I did write, write another one, thankfully, and that one is fully functional. Um, so uh, th those are just some of the concepts that go into crafting your own language. Unfortunately, this one um, didn't turn out as I would have liked. Um, so we're just going to go back um, here. And I know you guys must be wondering at this point, you know, there must be a more interesting application for using this parser generator than, you know, building boring transpilers of like, you know, classes from one language to the other. And I thought there was. Um, so I decided to write what I call Uniform. Um, and it's still in its beginning stages, but it uses the peg parser to generate um, a uh, JSON output from uh, input that looks less like a program and more like a tweet. Um, so the, expen the expected input in that scenario would be, you know, the at symbol followed by um, a category name, then a property name followed by its value, and then another property name followed by its value, and, and so on and so forth. So theoretically, you know, you, sh you might be able to abolish a form altogether and sort of say, um, you know, when the user gets to your form, it's like, oh, well, these are the properties, and all you have to do is enter the, um, the values. And it's debatable whether or not that's more usable than the form, but I was just sort of like, you know, interested in whether or not that would be viable. And that's what the output, the expected output would be. Um, so I have a little, little demo. Here we have our input box. Um, and it's not made apparent here, but by changing the category name, which is uh, bookended by the at symbol, uh, the color changes. So you'd think, oh, well, I want to create a housing listing. Let's say we're on a classified advertising website. Um, then we'd say, we'd tell the user, OK, one of the properties is rooms. And this one has three, and you know the rent is say 2,500. Yeah, that's a deal, right? Like, where, where, are, where are we? Like, <laughs> it's non-existent. Um, so yeah, uh, this is the sort of thing I thought would be kind of interesting. Um, and it was very easy to build this sort of interaction using a peg parser. And I'm going to show you guys what the grammar looks like. Um, so you know, of course, it would turn gray. Um, so. Right. So as before, um, in this scenario, instead of saying class de definition, we're beginning with an expression. Um, and an expression consists of as many categories as you'd like, um, which is denoted by that asterisk, followed by as many properties as you'd like. Um, and it, I mean, this is all very self-explanatory if you look at it. Just sort of like categories, you know, white space, followed by the at symbol, followed by a word, which is defined as, you know, just like before A through Z. Um, with an asterisk following it, um, signifying that its length might, can be infinite, um, and more white space. Um, and a property 
similarly um, is white space followed by you know the hash and a word with more white space and then a phrase which is defined um, well an alphanumeric rather um, which is defined as you know the numbers it can be a through z or you know zero through nine um, so if you wanted one of those values to say be um, a word, well, I don't know if this is going to crash. You could say, you know, oh, well, that value was crashed, and then you'd send that off to the server. Um, so, yeah, that's uniform. Um, that's where it's at right now. And I think I've lost my uh, presentation. So yeah, um, here are a few resources. Um, there's the PEG.js uh, documentation site if you if you guys are interested in creating your own languages. Um, there's the Wikipedia page on that explains what parsing expression grammars are. Um, it's not light reading; you may fall asleep. <laughs> um, and yeah, there's also a course on creating your own programming language on uh, Nathan's University. In fact, it's the only course on that site, but it's very good. Um, and you have to write. Um, you have to pass a unit test um, for each implementation of your language detail. Um, and it's very solid. So yeah, that's, that's about it. Um, do you guys have any questions? Yeah. I think this is really good. Cool. <coughs> have an application of what to use this for. I just, I just thought of as just using this to talk. But I was wondering if the, the match expressions, if, can they actually be JavaScript as well, or do they have to be constants? only wanted to allow certain, you know, a, a set of variables that you would be kind of importing into the, into the grammar as opposed to defining every single one to do that. Uh, yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned that. You can certainly do that. Um, and, wow, this is, uh, okay, so in the documentation here, uh, this is the beginning of uh, a grammar. Uh, at the very top, uh, there is a function definition. Um, so theoretically, if you wanted to like pull from somewhere else some arbitrary data and have it um, be part of you know your grammar, you could do so and then call it in your. Yeah, exactly. So. But that's the output, or is that the match? Well, this is the output. So when it when the parser encounters. Um, a string of numbers, uh, you can, so for example, we have an integer here. Um, anything defined as a primary that gets detected is going to be run through the make integer um, function. So it's going to, so for example, if we were multiplying something, it would look and it would say, oh, hey, you know, I have a primary. Um, and that consists of an integer, and an integer consists of a string of numbers that must be at least a uh, length of one, and it's gonna pass that into the function that you defined at the top and do whatever you, you'd like to do in there. Um, so did, did I answer your? I think so. Oh, oh, okay, I see what you're saying, yeah. Um, yeah, you can do that in the grammar itself, um, but that may end up becoming a little bit lengthy. And you could also, I mean, I, I'd imagine, like, you know, writing a function that returned an array of, you know, all of the words that were keywords in the language, and then, you know, sort of checking that against uh, whatever was coming in. Um, I don't know what implementation you'd want to go about using, but you could certainly do that um, with this parser generator. Uh, yeah, so. Because that's what we're interested in, because it's really the, well, for, for, for dumb fucks like me, we just want to produce work, right? 
Uh, no, this particular, um, this was born out of a personal project that I was doing, um, and I was interested in testing out a user interface thing. But the this parser generator is very powerful. So for example, like if you wanted to parse um, an incoming CSV for some really boring, you know, business application, and you, you know, you had a Node app, and you're like, oh, I want to be able to do that, and I want to do it fast, and I want to do it fluidly, you can... Very easily, you know, npm install pegjs, um, write your parser, and then when that boring CSV comes in every morning, it's like, oh well, that's pretty easy to do because I've defined this grammar for doing so. Um, I, I think maybe uh, for this audience that might have been a bit more useful, but I thought, um, you know, the UI example was a bit more playful and fun. Um, but it's certainly uh, a robust enough tool that if you needed to use it for something boring and work-related to actually get work done, you could. Um, and I'd encourage you to check out the documentation um, to check it out and, and play around with some boring real world stuff. Um, I wish there's a standard markdown. <laughs> <laughs> Could be anything. Yeah. Wait, that's not the new name. That's, that's not the new name. Common markdown. <laughs> oh, man, that sounds kind of common. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, does anyone have any other?